Repertory in Britain. From the Midlands, we present the Northampton Repertory Theatre in Helen Jerome's dramatization of Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, with Caroline Maud as Jane Eyre and Alan Brown as Mr. Rochester. This, dear listener, is a story of love, of a woman's love, tender, strong, and triumphant. A turbulent tale, which proves yet again the truth of the time-honored opinion that the course of true love never does run smooth. Since every tale must have not only an ending, but a beginning as well, let's start our narrative at the point where this story really opens for our young heroine, Jane Eyre, on that fateful evening in October 1845, when she first expectantly entered Thornfield Hall. Did you ring, Mum? Miss Eyre should be here any minute now. Yes, Mum. I have a room already next to Miss Adele. Show her in here when she comes and tell John to carry her trunk upstairs. Oh, Mum, isn't it exciting? A governess for Miss Adele at last. She's been watching from the nursery windows this last hour. That will be all, dear. Oh, this may be Miss Eyre now. Go and see, my girl. Will you come this way, Miss Eyre? Miss Eyre, Mrs. Fairfax. How do you do, my dear? I'm afraid you've had a tedious ride. You must be cold. Come to the fire. Mrs. Fairfax, I suppose. Yes. Now, do sit down. Now, let me help you off with your bonnet and shawl. Your gloves, dear. Oh, please don't bother. Indeed, it's no bother. And I dare say your hands are quite numb with the cold. Leah has made a little hot negus and cut a sandwich or two. There, my dear. Thank you. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax this evening? What did you say, dear? Shall I see my pupil, Miss Fairfax, soon? Oh, you mean Miss Varens. Adele Varens is her name. Oh, then she's not your granddaughter. No, I have no family. I'm so glad you are come, Miss Eyre. It will be quite pleasant living here with a companion. Thornfield is a fine old hall, but you know, in winter one is dreary alone. But my pupil... Oh, she's company enough, but she only arrived a few weeks ago. I was glad. A child makes a house alive. And now you. I shall be quite gay. I know you're going to like Thornfield. It's lovely here in spring and summer. If only Mr. Rochester would take it into his head to reside here permanently. Mr. Rochester? Who is he? The owner of Thornfield. I thought it belonged to you. Bless you, child, what an idea. No, I'm only the housekeeper. I'm distantly related to Mr. Rochester, but I never presume on it. And the little girl, my pupil? She is Mr. Rochester's ward. She's French. I can hardly understand her when she speaks, for she mixes the English so with the French. It sounds quite heathenish. Does Mr. Rochester ever come here? Oh, yes, but never for long. He hates the place. Hates it? Yes, hates it. When he does come, it's always unexpectedly. He's a strange man. Wanders round the world most of the time. Never laughs. He sounds unhappy. People who wander around the world all the time are usually running away from something. Some ache they want to pretend isn't there. Oh, he's not strikingly peculiar, my dear. But when he speaks to you, it's hard to know whether he's in jest or earnest. But you are not likely to come into contact with him a great deal, as your schoolroom is in another part of the house. You've no idea how vast a place this is, my dear. The West Wing, especially. Uh, this room leads to it, though it's many passages away. Oh, yes? The servants think it's haunted. Haunted? <laughs> oh, but of course, that's nonsense. Uh, still, if you should hear any unexpected noise from there, don't be alarmed. It'll probably be Grace Poole. Who is she? She is a person we have to sew and assist Leah with the housework. Not altogether objectionable in some points, but uh, faithful. Uh, yes, faithful, that's certain. Faithful? I do hope you're not inclined to be nervous, my dear. Perhaps you're not accustomed to living in such a big house. Oh, no, I'm not nervous. Besides, I've never lived in anything else. Lowood, where I've been for the past eight years, is huge. Pupils, teachers and servants. You were teaching there? Only for the last two years. Up till then, I was a pupil. 
act well. I'll run upstairs and see to your room. Now, uh, promise me you won't be nervous. Not a bit. I'll just sit here and warm myself by this lovely fire. That's right. I hope you'll be very happy here, dear. And who might you be? Oh, sir. Where do you come from? Have you descended from a moonbeam, or are you a discontented hamadryad escaped from your oaky prison? I am just Jane Eyre, the new governess. Oh, do you take me? I'd forgotten. The new governess, just Jane Eyre. Well, don't you want to know who I am? I have no such unwarrantable desire, sir, except to wonder at your form of address and what you are doing here. <laughs> There's a famous sting for me. What indeed am I doing here near the casket of my treasure? Why am I in the vicinity of this great house with its ivy-covered battlements, its old ancestral trees, and its smoothly shaven lawn? Is it not an earthly paradise? I've seen little of it yet, but as far as I have seen, it certainly seems so, externally. But who then are you? Only the owner of the house in which you seem so much at home. Oh, excuse me, sir. I didn't know you had arrived. Well, you know now. Kindly tell Mrs. Fairfax I'm here. Certainly, sir. At once. John? John! Welcome home, master. Oh, there you are, John. Do you see to my horse? Sure. It was the first thing I did the very minute I heard your honour was home. And the fine sweat the poor beast was in. Well, rub him down. And don't give him any water till he's dry. Yes, your honour. And, sir, if you please. Well, what is it you want to bother me about? It is about the West Wing, sir. What have you to do with the West Wing? Well, not a thing, thanks be to God, Your Honour. Uh, saving your presence. Septim, the other night, Grace Poole sent for me to fix on the hinge to one of them doors. And as sure as I'm alive, sir, the place is haunted. Did you see anything? Oh, no, sir. But I heard the most awful screech, like one of them banshees we have in the old country. And then the creature laughed, and the heart of my body was likely to freeze. An owl hooting, probably. What was Grace Poole's explanation? Sure, she accused me of being tipsy. Said I'd better give up my drop of toddy. Well, the only comfort a man has these cold nights. And she may have been right. If there's a ghost there, it need not trouble you, John. Keep out of that wing and see that none of the other servants become hysterical over this nonsense. I will, sir. It's quite likely some owls have made their nests in the battlements. There are no ghosts. Would that there were. That will be all. You may go. Yes, Your Honor. Oh, Mr. Rochester, why didn't you tell me? Let me know you were coming. I would have sent John with the carriage to meet you on the road. Come in, Adele. Oh, cher monsieur, how happy I am to see you. I wish to be embraced. Now, don't be fussy, Adele. Are you being a good girl? Mais oui, monsieur. Here is Miss Eyre, sir. Let Miss Eyre be seated. N'est-ce pas, monsieur, qu'il y a un cadeau pour mademoiselle Eyre dans votre petit corps? Who talks of cadeau? Did you expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? I hardly know, sir. I've had little experience of them. They are generally thought of as pleasant things. Generally thought? But what do you think? Well, I should have to consider before answering that. A present has many faces. Come to the fire, Miss Eyre. Where do you come from? Lowood School, sir. Ah, a charitable concern. How long were you there? Eight years. You must be very tenacious of life. I should have thought half that time in such a place would have done up any constitution. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. Where are your parents? I have none. Hm. Never had any, I suppose. You were brought hither by the men in green, I dare say. The men in green forsook England a hundred years ago. I don't think summer or harvest or winter moon will shine on their revels more. Who recommended you to come here? I advertised and Mrs. Fairfax answered. Yes, and I'm thankful that the choice Providence led me to make. Don't trouble yourself to give Miss Eyre a character, Mrs. Fairfax. Eulogizing will not bias me. She began by questioning my right of entry into my own house. Have you ever lived in a town, Miss Eyre? No, sir. You have never mixed with people? Only the pupils and teachers at Lowood. And now the inmates of Thornfield. Inmates? Leah says there is a ghost in the West Wing. It gives me to fear. Nonsense. If Leah says it again, she'll be discharged. Oh, but, monsieur, I have heard myself. <laughs> the noise is terrible sometimes. Miss Eyre, take your charge away to the schoolroom. Be off with both of you. Oh, come, I don't. I hope you will not allow this French monkey to fill your head with nonsense about ghosts. You don't look like a fool, but you are a woman. I don't believe I'm more so than the average. The average will be quite foolish enough. 
May I embrace you, cher monsieur? You may not. Oh, Be off. Oh, Adele, come, Miss Eyre. I'm sure you would like to see your room. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Fairfax. Yes, indeed. Grace? Grace Poole? Yes, Mr. Rochester? Come in here and lock the door. Can't you do anything about that infernal noise? I thought you'd managed to stop her. Have you ever tried stopping her doing something she set her mind on, sir? I have a new governess in the house, and I don't want her frightened away. Well, unless I punish her, I can't stop her making a noise. She gets worse all the time. Last night, she tried to set the house on fire. And when I caught her at it, she just laughed. Hysterical laugh. Laugh? It sounds more like fiends holding revelry in hell. What do you tell the servants? Anything I can think of. That it's owls hooting. The wind. But I can see that John doesn't swallow it. Well, those that don't can go. Mrs. Fairfax is the only one who knows those cries come from a human being. Well, you're a good soul, Grace. But keep your part of the West Wing securely locked. Yes, sir, and you keep yours. When you hear her, she's managed to outwit me and get into this part of the house. I can't always be with her. And you won't have her chained. Though it might be better. Safer for you, sir. How so? She's been raving about you again. She'll do something terrible one of these nights. It's the one thing she's bent on. Now don't worry about me. We can't chain her. She's human. Though God knows there's little sign of it left. Now don't hurt her. And don't let her out of your sight. And Miss Poole. Yes, Mr. Rochester? See that none of the other servants enter that wing. Now remember that. I'm raising your wages from tomorrow. God. Poor soul. Listen to her. Get back to your charge. Get her quiet. Tomorrow I'll order fresh locks for all the doors to the west wing. Now, you see, Adele, in this picture, the foreground only shows the dim peak of a hill with grass and some leaves slanting as if by a breeze. Above, you see an expanse of sky, dark blue as twilight. Did you paint that, Mademoiselle Eyre? Oh, art is beautiful. I shall never be so good an artist. <laughs> no, dear. It's not well done. But it gives you an idea. Now, you see that woman's figure rising into the sky? The dim forehead crowned by a star? Oh, yes. But what does it mean to say? You see the eyes shine dark and, and wild. Yes, we, we. But what is it? The evening star. Were you happy when you painted those, Miss Eyre? Oh, I didn't see you enter, sir. Do you mind us having our drawing lesson here? Mrs. Fairfax thought it would be warmer than the schoolroom. And we have also the more better light. Close the window, Adele. We love it, Oh, look how lovely it is. Sit down, both of you. No, I don't mind you having your lesson here, provided I am not condemned to be instructed. That I promise you, sir. Are you always so impolite, Miss Eyre? Your question, sir. Yes, I suppose I was happy when I was doing these things. Or as near as we ever come to it, I expect. You expect? Then you hope little from this delightful business of existence. I have had little. So, perhaps, all that there is. Your pleasures, by your own account, have been few. But I dare say you existed in a sort of artist's dreamland whilst you were painting these. You have secured the shadow of your thought in this one, though probably only the shadow. You have not enough of the artist's science and skill to give it full being. Yet these for a schoolgirl are peculiar, and you can have been very little more when you did them. Yes, I did them at Lowood in vacation time. You see, I never went home. I had none to go to. Is this one entirely your own work? Or probably a master helped. Oh, no, indeed. Ah, that pricks pride. Miss Eyre, you've been here about a month. I've not had time to find out certain things about you that arouse my curiosity. Now, answer my questions. I perceive that these pictures were done by hand. Was that hand yours? Yes, sir. Where did you get your models? Out of my head. And who taught you to paint wind? Well, there's a high gale in that sky and on this hilltop. I'm surprised they taught you anything half so valuable in that awful place. 
Oh, they didn't. I was giving a lesson to Adele. Had I better continue? It's Saturday morning. Let her have a holiday. Off you go, child. Oh, merci bien, monsieur. <laughs> You're very kind. So, you taught yourself to draw and paint, Miss Eyre. Can you play? A little. Of course. The established answer. I would like to hear you. Go in there. Well, you know by this time that the best piano forte in the house is through that arch. Oh, excuse my tone of command. I'm used to say do this and it is done. I can't alter my habits. Go then and play a tune, Miss Eyre. As you wish, sir. Enough. You are right, Miss Eyre. You play a little, like any other English schoolgirl, rather better than some. Oh, you are displeased, Miss Eyre, that I did not praise you more. You are too sensitive. Or is it too vain? I don't believe I am vain, sir. I suppose you were accustomed to compliments from your director at Lowood. Brocklehurst, wasn't it? A parson? Compliments from that man? You girls all worshipped him, of course. Oh, no. No? What, a novice not worship her priest? We all loathed him. He was harsh and pompous. He cut off our hair and, for economy's sake, bought us bad needles and thread. He starved us and bored us with his long lectures. He forced us to read books about sudden death and judgment and made us afraid to go to bed. He made my childhood a hell on earth. I thought so. You've been so reticent, Miss Eyre, that I'm very interested now that at last you are able to become articulate. It evidently takes anger to tempt you. Come and sit down. I wish to hear more of the ineffable Brocklehurst. You know, of course, that he is a pillar of the county and that his good deeds ring throughout the charitable annals of this part of England. Now, come, forget that I did not admire your playing and entertain me a little. I did not expect you to admire it. I don't admire it myself. I told you I played a little. You wanted proof. You got it. As for Brocklehurst and his good deeds, I think he is one of the worst men in the world. What sort of looking man is this Brocklehurst? He looks like a buttoned-up black tadpole. He has cruel eyes and thin, bloodless lips. He wears greenish, rusty black clothes, shiny and Christian martyrish. Oh, he was hypocritical, bigoted and mean. Mm. What was his object in this persecution of you? <laughs> to hurt something that is helpless. <sighs> the memory of those awful years. When I was a child, I could have killed that man with these two hands. They are very small. And how did you happen to be in such a place? Very simply. After my father and mother died, I was left in the care of an aunt who hated me. How old were you? Five. When I was ten, she decided to put me into a charity school. Was she poor? On the contrary. She lived in a great house. But I was a discord there. I had nothing in harmony with Mrs. Reed and her children. So you were removed... But why to a charity school? My aunt felt she had spent enough money on me. I'm glad of it. I preferred not to owe her anything more. As soon as I was old enough, I started to earn my keep. I began to teach when I was 16. At the school? I remained there until I came here. Excuse me, sir, but your estate agent is in your study. Ah, well, in that case, I must go. I fear I have been encouraging Miss Eyre in some gloomy memories. But you are mistaken. They no longer make me gloomy. Well, the recital makes others so. I like bright faces around me. Well, have you any complaint to make of mine, sir? I apologize. You will not be bored so again. If that is meant for repartee, I do not care for it. I... I thought you said Mr. Rochester was not peculiar. Well, is he? I think so. He is very changeful and abrupt. He may appear so to a stranger, but I am so accustomed to his manner, I never think about it. Besides, he deserves that some allowance should be made. Why? Partly because it's his nature, and we none of us can help our natures. 
and partly because he has painful thoughts. What about? Things have happened that make him want to shun this place. I don't know what they are, but I feel them. It's so difficult. One never knows how to take him. He hurts one so. You will be wise not to let him affect you in one way or another, my dear child. And when he is married... What? Well, why not? He's like other men, and not yet 40. Of course. It's just that one doesn't associate him with domesticity somehow. My dear, you are so young and so little acquainted with men. I want to put you on your guard. I'm sometimes uneasy the way he makes a sort of pet of you. The way he likes to draw you out. And then turns and snubs me, as you saw just now. Do you call that making a pet of me? Only remember, dear, all is not gold that glitters. And when Mr. Rochester marries, it will be to someone in his own sphere of life. Why, only a few weeks ago, he said to me, what if I determined to put my old bachelor's head in the sacred noose, Mrs. Fairfax? Was he serious? Oh, yes. He even mentioned her name. Miss Blanche Ingram. Have you ever seen her, Mrs. Fairfax? Indeed, I have. She came here to a Christmas ball and party Mr. Rochester gave. The ladies were magnificently dressed. Most of them were handsome, but Miss Ingram was certainly the queen. What is she like? Tall, fine bust, sloping shoulders, a long, graceful neck, eyes somewhat like Mr. Rochester's. Large and dark and, and as brilliant as her jewels. She was dressed in amber velvet. Was she greatly admired? Oh, yes, greatly. And you'll see why for yourself, for Mr. Rochester is to be giving another party soon, I believe. Is she wealthy? She and her sister are the only daughters of the late Lord Ingram. There's not much money in the family, so if a rich gentleman like Mr. Rochester also happens to be as attractive as he is, well, we shall both be turned out back and baggage then, my dear. <laughs> You'll see. Jane Eyre, you have nothing to do with the master of Thornfield, except to receive your salary and be grateful for his respect and kind treatment. Be too self-respecting to give your heart where it's not even thought of, let alone wanted. Yes, and listen, Jane Eyre, to your sentence. Go and draw your own likeness in chalk. Don't compromise with it. And right underneath, portrait of a governess, disconnected, poor, and plain. And, dear listener, these same sentiments were still uppermost in our heroine's mind when, about a week later, she was summoned to the library by her employer and commanded to be seated. Draw your chair closer, Miss Eyre. You're too far back. I can't see you without changing my position, which in this very comfortable chair I've no mind to do. You examine me, Miss Eyre. Do you find me handsome? No, sir. By my word, there's something very singular about you. You sit there, quiet, grave and simple, with your hands in front of you and your eyes on the ground. Yet when one asks you a question, you wrap out a reply, which, if not blunt, is at least brusque. Sir, I was too plain. I beg your pardon. I should have replied that tastes differ, that beauty is of little consequence, or something of the sort. You should have replied nothing of the kind. Well, go on. What fault do you find with me, pray? I suppose I have all my limbs and features, like other men. Mr. Rochester, I intended no pointed repartee. It was only a blunder. Just so. And you shall be answerable for it. Criticize me. Does my forehead not please you? Have I no bump of benevolence showing? Oh, come, ma'am, look well. Am I a fool? Far from it. 
You would perhaps think me rude if I inquired whether you are a philanthropist. <laughs> oh, no, young lady. I am not a general philanthropist. Though I once had a rude tenderness of heart, but now I flatter myself I'm hard and tough as a rubber ball. Does that leave hope for me? Hope of what, sir? Of my final retransformation back to flesh. You look very puzzled, Miss Eyre. And although you are no more pretty than I am handsome, it becomes you very well. Young lady, I'm inclined to be gregarious and communicative tonight. That is why I sent for you. The fire and the candles are not sufficient companionship. You puzzle me. It would please me to draw you out and learn more of you. Therefore, speak. What about, sir? Or whatever you like. I leave both the choice of the subject and the manner of treating it to you. You are silent, Miss Eyre. Stubborn and annoyed. It is consistent. I put my request in an insolent form, Miss Eyre. I beg your pardon. The fact is, I don't want to treat you as an inferior. I desire you to have the goodness to talk to me a little to divert my thoughts. You know, Miss Eyre, I envy you. I envy you your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. Oh, child, a memory like that must be an exquisite treasure. Sir, how was your memory when you were 18? Oh, I was your equal at 18. Oh, quite your equal. You see, I was meant by nature to be a good man. But you see, I am not. Uh, you will say you do not see it. At least I flatter myself I read as much in your eyes. Beware, by the by, what you express with that organ. You wonder why I admit all these things to you. Know that in the course of your future life, you will often find yourself the confidant of other people's secrets. They will realize that it is not your forte to talk of yourself, but to listen. Misfortune has caused me to degenerate. Dread remorse, Miss Eyre, whenever you are tempted to do wrong. Remorse is the poison of life. Repentance is said to be its cure, sir. Well, it is not. Reformation, maybe. Now, I could reform, perhaps. A sweet thought comes to me that may heal me. My heart was a sort of charnel. It may now become a shrine. To speak the truth, sir, I don't understand you at all. I can't keep up the conversation. It has got out of my depth. But one thing I can understand. You say you're not as good as you would like to be. If you try hard, you can be. Where are you going? To put Adele to bed. It's past her time. You're afraid of me because I talk like a sphinx? Your language is enigmatical, sir. And though I am bewildered, I am certainly not afraid. I don't want to talk nonsense. And I easily might, being utterly in the dark. Well, if you did, it would probably be with such a quaint, grave air that I should mistake it for sense. Come here. Sir? Adele is not ready to go to bed yet. You may be sure she's gone upstairs, dragging Mrs. Fairfax with her to try on the dress I brought home for her tonight. Yes, she's her mother's daughter. That French mother that charmed the gold out of my English breeches. You see, I've been green too once, Miss Eyre. No more vernal tint freshened you than once freshened me. My spring is gone. But it has left me with that little French floweret on my hands. I rear her on the Roman Catholic principle of expiating numerous sins with one good work. You talk in riddles. <laughs> oh, do I? Oh, no matter. I'll explain all this someday. Good night. And say good night to Adele for me, too. Good night, Mr. Rochester. It's nice to see Mr. Rochester so gay. Generally, he dislikes company, but tonight he seems to have put himself out to entertain the party. Miss Blanche Ingram is the attraction. He evidently prefers her to any of the other ladies. I told you he admired her, Jane. And she him. Look how she leans her head towards him. I shall be glad when they've gone. 
I prefer Thornfield as it's been these last months. Quiet, peaceful, remote. I know, my dear. I observed to Mr. Rochester that you were unused to company, and I did not think you would like appearing before so gay a party. Why, then, did he insist on my coming in? I cannot understand it. I don't know. All he said to me was, tell her it is my particular wish. If she objects, and if she resists, Say, I shall come and fetch her. Well, I've saved him that trouble. <laughs> but see, the party is rising, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, they're coming in here. Now stay quiet, my dear, and they'll not notice you. I must go, as Mr. Rochester has not requested my presence. It's quite early. I will return when they have gone. <laughs> <laughs> they like the celebrated Blanche Ingram. I suppose we must allow she's pretty. Yes, Amy, she's pretty, but I cannot endure her airs and graces. And such condescension, Louisa. Who is that young person who curtsied to us just now? Only the governess to Rochester's ward, I believe. Oh, my word. What has a very fine notion of a dinner. Haven't had so good a one since I don't know when. Our Colonel Dent, he has a wonderful housekeeper. A distant relative, I believe. A good idea, don't you think? Quite excellent. He can combine charity with utility. You take me. I must see if I can't find a housekeeper amongst my relations. <laughs> Colonel Dent, did you notice Lady Ingram at dinner? <laughs> Too busy noticing you, Miss Louisa. <laughs> oh, flatterer. <laughs> did you not see how pleased she was looking, Amy? Oh, yes, indeed. I think the wedding bells are not far off. What did you say, Colonel Dent? Is not Miss Ingram a chance such as Mr. Rochester will be likely to take? Upon my honor, Miss Louisa, I dare not swear to his taste in female beauty. Most gentlemen would admire her, I suppose. Well, if he likes the majestic, Miss Louisa, she is a bare epitome of majesty. Look, here they come. Lady Ingram's dress is certainly magnificent. But that awful daughter. Thank you, dear Rochester. It's been a delightful evening, really quite delightful. But it's getting late. We have a 20-mile drive before us. Not yet, Mama. Mr. Rochester has promised to sing a duet with me before we leave. I wish to try his voice. By the way, Mr. Rochester, I thought you were not fond of children. Oh, nor am I. Then where did you pick up that little French doll I hear you have here at Thornfield? I did not pick her up. She was left on my hands, Blanche. You have a governess for her? I thought I saw a person here just now. Is she gone? Oh, no. There she is. <laughs> Quite expensive, I should think. Two extra people to keep. Oh, I have not considered the subject. No, no you men never consider economy and common sense. Oh, come now, Miss Sponge. For my honour, that's very... Oh, I've had a dozen governesses in my time, at least. Half of them detestable, the rest ridiculous. You should hear Mama on the subject of governesses. Don't mention governesses. I have suffered a martyrdom from their incompetence and caprice. Not that I ever suffered much from them. I took good care to turn the tables. Theodore's tutor and my governess actually took the liberty of falling in love with each other. <laughs> Dear Mama, as soon as she got an inkling of the business, discovered it was of an immoral tendency. <laughs> and I was quite right. Depend on it. Liaisons between governesses and tutors should never be tolerated in a well-regulated house. Yeah, yeah. Firstly, oh, they... gracious Mama, spare us the enumerations. We all know them. I move the introduction of a new topic. Mr. Rochester, do you second the motion? I support you on this point, Blanche, as on every other. Then, dear Rochester, I lay on you my sovereign behest to furbish up your lungs in my royal service. Commands from Miss Ingram would put spirit into a jug of milk and water. Who would not be the Rizzio of so charming a Mary? Oh, Rizzio. I like Black Bothwell better. To my mind, a man is nothing without a spice of the devil in him. Ah, do you hear that, Dent? Do you resemble Bothwell? I should say the preference rests with you, sir. Well, for my honor, I'm very much obliged to you. Do you endorse that? Look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but Rizzio serenaded his lady. Will not Mr. Rochester be at least as gallant? Oh, yes, do let's have a song. Upon myself, an excellent way to finish a very charming evening. Let them sing together a duet. That lovely old duet from Don Giovanni that you sang at our house last week. What do you say, Mr. Rochester? Can you do me justice in a duet? I will do my poor best. You may kiss my hand, Rochester. But mind, if you don't sing well, I shall punish you. I have my message. You know. Oh, no, I could not endure that. You have too much power invested in you, my dear Blanche. A mere frown from you, and I am worse than hanged. Oh, I would not hang you yet, sir. 
I have other uses for you. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you, Louisa? She's an insufferable creature. So forward, too. I vow I almost blushed for him, Amy. I can hardly resist the wretch myself. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Thornfield, as elsewhere, winter gave way to spring, and the April evening, when we resume our strange love story, was mild and fragrant. Ah, are you alone, Mrs. Fairfax? Where is Miss Eyre? She always likes to be in the orchard at this hour, sir. She said yesterday that these evenings were as if a band of Italian days had come from the south like a flock of glorious passenger birds. <laughs> she says the queerest things. Poets are always queer to the rest of us. You think her a poet? She likes nooks and secret places. A strange little soul. Yes, Mrs. Fairfax, I think her a poet. And for that, born to suffer... She haunts the place where silence reigns and gloaming gathers. Do you get the combined sense of an English evening, ma'am? Come over here by the window and drink them in. And look, there's Jane's little form. Do you see her? Yes, she's cutting some flowers for your table, sir. You have not ridden over to Lord Ingram's lately. To be sure, Ingram Park is 20 miles away... But Miss Blanche is beautiful enough to be worth it. You remember, you mentioned something. And being female, the mere hint of a wedding imprinted itself on your mind. <laughs> Did you mention the possibility to Miss Eyre? Well, yes. The other night, just after the party. Was Miss Eyre impressed by the beautiful Miss Ingram? Oh, yes. She thought her very lovely. And very suitable, no doubt. She was pleased at the idea of Thornfield having a mistress? I fancy she was glad to think that you'd not be alone anymore. Oh, very thoughtful of her. So you have both married me off to the Honourable Miss Ingram. Is the lady aware of your plans? Oh, Is Miss Eyre under the impression that she will continue to walk in the orchard at Thornfield when it has a mistress? Here she is now. She can speak for herself. Oh, Mrs. Fairfax, I do love this place. How shall I ever be able to bear leaving it? I think you have received your answer, Mr. Rochester. You may go, Mrs. Fairfax. I didn't notice you there, sir. I, too, will wish you good night. You will do nothing of the kind. So you find Thornfield a pleasant place. You can imagine it in summer. Yes, it must be beautiful. You will have become in some degree attached to the house. You have so much feeling for beauty. I am attached to it. Pity. Still, life is always like that. No sooner have you become planted in a congenial soil than some rude gardener, fate perhaps, uproots you. You must rise and move on. Must I move on? Must I leave Thornfield? I believe you must, Jane. I'm sorry, Jane, but I believe indeed you must. Well... I shall be ready when the order to march comes. The order to march has come now. I must give it tonight. Then you are going to be married. Exactly. With your usual acuteness, you have hit the nail straight on the head. Soon? Quite soon, my... Miss Eyre. And you'll remember, Jane, when Mrs. Fairfax plainly intimated the possibility to you that it was my intention to take the Honourable Miss Ingram to my bosom. She's quite an armful, by the way. Although, of course, one can't have too much of a good thing, can one? But you're not listening to me, Jane. Do you remember you said that if I should marry, you and Adele would have to go forthwith? You did say that, didn't you? Yes, to Mrs. Fairfax. <laughs> yes. I'll pass over the slur on the character of my beloved. Indeed, I'll try to forget it. And remember only its wisdom, which is such that I've made it my law of action. Adele must go to school, and you, Miss Eyre, must get a new situation. Very well. I will advertise immediately. And in the meantime, I suppose I may stay here until I find myself a new position. Certainly. I consider that when a dependent has done her duty as well as you have done yours, she has a sort of claim on her employer... 
In fact, I've already heard of something that I think will suit you. It is to undertake the education of the five daughters of Mrs. Dionysus O'Gall of the Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland. Ireland? It's a long way off, isn't it? From what, Jane? From England, from Thornfield, and... Well? From you. The thought of Mrs. O'Gall and Bitternut Lodge strikes cold to my heart. It's such a long way. It is indeed, Jane. And when you get to Bitternut Lodge, Connaught, Ireland, I shall never see you again. That's morally certain. So come, let's sit comfortably on this last evening we shall spend together, like the good friends we've been. It's a long way to Ireland, Jane. I'm sorry to send my little friend on such a long, weary travel, but how is it to be helped? Are you anything akin to me, do you think, Jane? Because I have a strange feeling with regard to you, especially when you're near to me like this. I love Thornfield. I've lived since I entered it. I've known you, and it fills me with terror and anguish to think I shall never see you again. I see the necessity of departure, and it's like looking at the necessity of death. Where do you see the necessity? Where? Well, haven't you just placed it before me? In what shape? Miss Ingram's, your wife. My wife? I have no wife. But you will have. Yes, I will. Then I must go. You said it yourself. No. You must stay. I tell you, I must go. Do you think I can stay here to become nothing to you? Do you think because I'm little, obscure, poor and plain, I'm also soulless, heartless? I've as much soul as you and more heart. And if God had gifted me some beauty and much wealth, I should have made it as hard for you to leave me as it is now for me to leave you. Oh, I'm not talking to you now through the medium of conventionality or of mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, just as if we both had passed through a grave and we stood at the feet of God, equal, as we are. As we are. Yes, and yet not so, for you are going to marry a woman who is inferior to you and whom you do not love. I would scorn to do such a thing. Therefore, I am better than you. Jane! Let me go. Where? To Ireland? Jane, be still. Don't struggle so like a wild, frantic bird in the net. I'm no bird and no net ensnares me. I'm a free human being with an independent will. And your will shall decide your destiny. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. I ask you to pass through life at my side. You have made your choice. You must abide by it. Come to me, Jane. It is you that I love. You, poor, obscure, plain, and little as you are. Then why have you been torturing me? I had to be sure. You kept me aloof, showed me only your mind. I wanted your heart as well. You hid it. You are a woman. I made you jealous. It was unworthy of you. But successful. Do you doubt me now, Jane? Entirely. You've no faith in me? None whatever. Am I a liar in your eyes? Oh, Jane. I entreat you to accept me as husband. Say yes quickly. I must have you for my own. Jane, do you love me? Let me look at your face. Do you love me? With all my heart. That sentence has penetrated my breast. Oh, Jane, don't look so good. So much as though a spirit were near me. God forgive me. And let no one come between us. I have you. And I will keep you. But there is no one to come between us. I have no kindred to interfere. At least... No. Are you happy, Jane? 
so happy. It frightens me. Will I not guard, cherish, and solace you? It will atone. It will atone. Kiss me, Jane. For Jane, the cup of happiness was indeed brimming. And the following month passed in a flurry of activity. For the coming of May brought with it the crowning moment of any young girl's life. A wedding day. It's a good thing the church is only just across the, the meadow, Leah. Miss Eyre won't spoil her little white shoes. Yeah, what a picture she does look in her bridal frock. I could hardly keep from telling her as I passed it up a little while ago. She seems to have grown quite pretty lately. Happiness is a wonderful beautifier, my girl. Oh, it's a pity we can't all have a little more of it. I come from being in love, ma'am. It's a grand medicine. It's time they were downstairs. We must be getting ready to go over to church. I wonder if the minister is there yet. Oh, but of course he is. He's even nearer than we are. Never fear, ma'am. Mr. Wood's never been late for a wedding yet. Not even his own, more's the pity. Leah, a man of God, you shouldn't really. Put him as married Mr. Rochester's ma and pa, ain't it, ma'am? Yeah, I wonder what the old folks would have said to this wedding. It'll be a sweet wedding, howsoever, won't it? Eh, hey, look at the sunshine. Yes, God does seem to be smiling on them. They both seem marvellously happy. It almost frightens me when people are so happy. Don't seem to last long as a rule, does it, ma'am? But if I was Miss Eyre, the first thing I should do when I got back from my honeymoon in foreign parts, I'd lock up that west wing. You take it from me, ma'am, that west wing is haunted, so it is. Oh, Leah, really? I know what I know, and I'd send that horrid Grace Poole packing, too. Oh, that woman fair gives me the creeps. Sneaking and creeping about all over the place and never speaking a word to a soul. I know that... That will do, Leah. Now run along and see if John's in his livery yet and give a final brush up to yourself. Very good, ma'am. You ought to look your best when you have the honor to witness your master's marriage. Good morning, Mrs. Fairfax. Is, isn't Miss Eyre down yet? I want to take her over to the church myself. I can't wait for her there. Now go and tell her to come at once. Oh, couldn't you try to be a little calmer, sir? Calm? Calm when my whole hope of life is at stake? Don't you hurry. I'm here. Oh, Jane. Jane, that this day was safely over, and you safely mine, and that no distance divide us ever again. But we're going to be married in a few minutes. How can distance divide us after that? Think of it. We shall soon be on our way to France. I shall see the mountains, the oceans. We shall leave Thornfield the moment we're married. Very well. You said that with such a strange smile. What's this bright spot of color and this? And why are your eyes glistening? Aren't you well, child? I believe I am. You believe? What's the matter? Tell me what you feel. I wish this present moment would never end. I can't believe this is really happening to me. You've been excited, Jane, overtired. Well, do you feel calm and happy? Calm, yes. Happy? Yes. Well, now it's time. Wood must be already in the church. God forbid he should be late. What are you dreading? Oh, come. Be at peace, my love. Nothing can take me away from you now. You swear that? No. Swearing is not being sure. I am sure nothing can take me away from you now. Mrs. Fairfax, bring the smelling salts. Yes, sir, at once. I'll put Miss Eyre down here on the sofa. There. Now then, Wood, an explanation. Surely that is due to me, Mr. Rochester. You should have proceeded with a ceremony. What right had this fellow bursting into your church, interrupting a marriage? But I couldn't possibly perform a marriage which I am told is illegal without proper investigation. You know that as well as I. This man claims that an impediment exists. Isn't that so, sir? An insuperable one. What is its nature? Mr. Rochester has a wife, Lily. Who are you? My name is Briggs. 
solicitor of Arundel Street, Strand, London. And you would thrust a wife on me? I would merely remind you of the lady's existence, which the law recognizes if you do not. Favor me with her name, parentage, and home. Now, kindly read the document, Mr. Briggs. I affirm that on October the 20th, 15 years ago, Edward Fairfax Rochester of Thornfield Hall in the county of Millcote was married to my sister, Bertha Antoinette Mason at St. Luigi's Church, Spanish Town, Jamaica. The record of that marriage can be found in the register of that church. Signed, Richard Mason. Well, that, if genuine, may prove that I have been married, but not that my wife is still living. She was living three months ago. How do you know? I have a witness to the fact. Produce him. Mr. Richard Mason, please. You called me, I believe. We did? Well, what have you to say? Come on, damn you! Is Mr. Rochester's wife still living, Mr. Mason? She is, Rector. Is she in this country? She lives in this house. The very house where this marriage was planned, Thornfield Hall. I saw her only last November. I am her brother. In this house? Impossible. I am an old resident of this neighborhood, and I've never heard of a Mrs. Rochester. How does it happen that you arrived just at this moment? Did you know of this intended marriage? Miss Eyre wrote of it to her uncle in Jamaica. He is, I believe, her only living relative. Yes, I wrote to my uncle, hoping he would be here in time for the wedding. I meant to surprise you with an actual connection between me and respectability. But where do you come in, ma'am? Do you know her uncle? We are members of the same business house. As soon as Mr. Eyre told me of his niece's intended marriage, I naturally felt it my duty God to come... God damn your soul! Mr. Rochester, not in my presence, if you please. Mr. Eyre is ill and so asked me to hurry to England to save his niece from a bigger mismarriage. I arrived in time and naturally went to Mr. Briggs, our family solicitor. But that paper, Mr. Briggs, can you substantiate it? This is all very shocking, very shocking indeed. Have you the original marriage certificate? Certainly. I have the original certificate here. I still cannot believe. I cannot believe. Enough of this. I'll out with it. Yes, I meant to be a bigamist. Ah, Mr. Rochester. But Providence checked me. I'm little better than a devil at this moment. And as my pastor there will no doubt tell you, probably deserving the sternest judgment of God, my plan is broken up, gentlemen. You say you've never heard of a Mrs. Rochester. Well, come along to the West Wing, all of you, and I'll present her. You shall make the acquaintance of the mistress of Thornfield. This way, gentlemen. You too, Mason. Come and meet your sister again. Rest here, Jane, my dear. Please wait until we return. Dear, it's Jane. My heart goes out to you. What can I do to help you in your sorrow? My life is empty. How blind have been my eyes. How weak my conduct. What will you do? My prospects are desolate. I should have foreseen. <laughs> but not this. Not this. Leave me to my bitter hour, please. Please leave me. As you wish. My dear sir, what can I say? What can I say? I always understood it was your sister who was mentally ill and whom you were guarding for her own good. Some of your parishioners decided that the lunatic was my cast-off mistress. Well, now you have seen her. My wife. Yes, she is mad. A homicidal maniac. A fact I discovered after I had married her. She is also a drunkard. Oh, dreadful, dreadful. Oh, yes, my life has been one long poem, I assure you would. Though no doubt even you, whose profession insists that God sends all tribulations for our own good, must wonder whose good has been achieved in this instance. Hers or mine? God's ways are in... Thus spare us, my dear rector. You all saw my wife a few moments ago when we entered her room. You saw her spring at my throat and try to fasten her teeth into it. Well, this sort of thing is evidently the sole conjugal embrace I am ever to know. 
the only endearment that is to solace my leisure hours for the rest of my life. Judge now whether I had the right to seek something human. This girl here knew no more of my secret than you did. I grew to care for her. Look at her now as she sits here, grave and quiet at the mouth of hell. Compare these clear eyes with those mad ones you've just seen. This delicate body with that other, this pure face with that drunken mask in there. And then judge me, priest of the gospel, a man of the law. And remember, you will be judged one day. And now away with you, all of you. Mason, come along. Rector, we had better go. Yes. No blame attaches to you in this matter, Miss Eyre. No blame, whatever. Oh, Jane. Why don't you weep, my darling? I see no trace of tears. Only that terrible, white, crucified face. Not one word of reproach. God knows I never meant to hurt you. I am tired and sick. I must go. No, Jane. You shan't leave me. I can read your thoughts. You won't say anything, but you're planning how to act. I know you. I'm on my guard. Could you think I want to act against you? No. But you're planning to leave me. To desert me. But you can't. You can't. I'll have her lodged in another house of mine. Or we'll leave this house to her. I'll give Grace Poole double her wages to stay with her alone. I know I should have told you the truth at first. I should have appealed to your magnanimity. As I do now, Jane. Will you hear reason? Because if you won't, I'll try violence. <sighs> so you don't love me then? It was the rank of my wife you valued. Now that I'm not to be your husband, you can't bear my touch. This is unworthy of you. I love you more than ever. But I will leave you. But why? 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 Your wife is living. If I lived with you as you desire, I should be your mistress. To say otherwise is false. Jane, I'm not a gentle-tempered man. I'm not cool and dispassionate. I'm not long-enduring. Out of pity for me and for yourself. Feel my pulse. Feel how it throbs. And beware. I will not be yours. Do you mean to go one way in the world and leave me to go another? I do. So you defy me. Never was anything at once so frail and yet so indomitable. I could bend you with my thumb and finger. But what good would it do to bend and crush you? Whatever I do with a cage, I can't get at the bird inside. And it's your spirit I want. Oh, Jane, for God's sake, don't leave me. Take one glance at my horrible life when you've gone. Where shall I turn for hope? Do as I do. Hope to meet in heaven. You're going? I'm going. You're leaving me? Yes. Forever. Jane, beside herself with misery, wandered she knew not where. But late on the evening of the fourth day, her footsteps led her to the door of a house at nearby White Cross. And here, coincidence without which few stories such as this one are complete, steps in, as you will learn. Listen, Hannah, I must read this to somebody. It's so beautiful. Oh, you won't understand the word of it, but listen just the same. The story is about Franz and Daniel, who are together in the night time. Franz is telling of a dream from which he awoke in terror. 
Da trat Herba eine anzusehen wie die Sterne nacht. Is there really a country where they talk like that? <laughs> yes, a far larger country than England, Hannah. Well, I don't know how they understand one from the other. And if you went there, Miss Dinah, could you understand what they said? Possibly some of it, not all. I'm not as clever as you think me, Hannah. I can't speak German, and I can only read it with the help of a dictionary. What good does that do you? I mean to teach it at my school one day, and earn a little more money than we have now. Very like that you should have someone to help you with that school. It's too much for one lone female. Oh, give over studying now, do you've done quite enough for one night. I think I will. I'm mortally tired. <sighs> I wonder what time my brother will be home. So much sickness in the parish. Oh, dear. Heavens, the witches are brewing potions of hate on the moors tonight. Did you hear how they wail? It's just on ten o'clock. St. John can't be long now. Hannah, will you have the goodness to look at the fire in his room? He may want to use it for tomorrow's sermon. Alas, it fair troubles me to go into that room now. It looks so lonesome with your father's chair empty. Nobody's in a better place, and nobody needs to have a quieter death than he had. You say father never mentioned me, Hannah. Alas, he hadn't time. He was gone in a minute. Your brother St. John had asked if you should be sent for, but your poor father said it was nothing and that you were not to be disturbed at your schoolhouse seeing you'd nobody to leave in charge. The poor gentleman knew you'd have to depend on your schoolhouse, seeing that your brother St. John has been called by God to go and convert the heathen in India. Is he really going? Yes, Hannah. He feels it's his vocation. Well, your father was the last of that old stock, I'm thinking. You and your brother are like to be a different sort to them that are gone. Perhaps it's as well. You know, Hannah, our mothers didn't have to support themselves. No, men had guts in them once. He was able to provide for their women. Please, please, is anyone there? Oh, no, whoever can that be at this time of night? Who's there? I'm a stranger. Well, I'll let you in to hear your business. The wind's screeching to death on a body. Come now, what do you want? What's your business at this hour in a respectable home? I want a night shelter and a morsel to eat. Well, I'll give you something to eat, but we can't take in a baby. Well, where shall I go if you drive me away? Oh, I'll warrant you know what to do and where to go. Mind you, don't do wrong, that's all. Oh, I've no strength to go further. Let me see your mistress. Indeed, I will not. You're not what you ought to be, or you wouldn't be in such a predicament. Now move off, I say. I must die if you turn me away. Not you. But if be like you've got any followers, housebreakers and such, well, we've got a gentleman here, I, and, and dogs and guns. Whatever are things coming to? Folks ain't safe in their own homes these days. Hannah? Hannah, who is it? Why, she's a beggar woman, Mr. St. John. No better than she ought to be. I told her to move off. Hush, Hannah. Give her some milk, Hannah. Try to drink this warm milk. Not too much at first. Ah, restrain her. What is your name? My name is Jane Elliot. And where do you live? Where are your friends? Can we send for anyone you know? No, no. What account can you give of yourself? Sir, I can give you no details tonight. What then do you expect me to do for you? Do with me as you like. I will trust you. If I were a stray dog, I know you would not turn me from your hearth tonight. Hannah, let her rest there a while. And ask her no questions. Give her a little more milk and a morsel of bread. You must eat very moderately at first, after having abstained for some time. I trust I shall not eat at your expense for long, sir. No. When you have given me the address of your friends, I can write to them. In the meantime, my sister and I wish you to be our guest. I'm grateful. More than I can say. But... I cannot give you any addresses. I have neither home nor friends. No friends? A most singular position for a girl of your age. You've never been married. Why, she's not 18. I am 19, but I've not been married, no. Where did you last reside? Really, St. John, you're too inquisitive. 
The name of the place and the name of the person is my secret. Which you have a right to keep. Well, if I'm to know nothing of your history, how do you expect me to help you? You need help, do you not? Only to get work. My capabilities are important for that, not my private history. What then can you do? I was educated at Lowood Orphan Asylum. Yes. I left there a year ago to take a position as governess. I see. I was happy there until four days ago when I was obliged to leave hurriedly. I left everything I possessed behind me. Poor little Jane Elliot. What? You said that was your name? Yes, I did. But it isn't my real name. And you refused to give it to us? Yes. I must remain lost. And your reason, I'm sure, is a good one. Oh, leave her in peace now, brother. Listen, my dear Miss Elliot, I have a plan to propose to you. I have a little school close by, and I need help badly. You mean it? You will let me stay here uh, and work with you and be safe? You've suffered terribly. Anyone can see that. Now you're going to rest in bed for a few days. Hannah will nurse you back to health. Hannah, go upstairs and prepare my room for Miss Elliot. I'll sleep in the spare room. I'll make a fire there, too. The little creature looks almost frozen. I think they like she's sickening for the chill. You'll be well and strong in a few days. And after that, life will reflower. That's one blessing about youth. It does recover. A Christmas frost has come at midsummer. But there's always another spring. Not for me. But, my dear, you're so young. Life stretches before you. A white December has whirled over June. Drifts have crushed the blowing roses. I looked at my love. It shivers in my heart like a suffering child. My dear, what terrible sin was committed against you? Oh, no, do not ask me. I came into deep waters. The floods overwhelmed me. <laughs> yes, indeed. The floods overwhelmed me. <laughs> Little creature hasn't come home yet, Miss Steiner. I think be like she's gone walking on them more. Oh, what a way to speak of Miss Jane. If I didn't know you did it in affection. Oh, who could help loving her? Oh, what a treasure she's been these past 12 months. The school has got on splendidly. Oh, she's a wonderful person, Hannah. I wish she wasn't so fond of those moors, though. It's where she takes her grieving and her dreams. She never speaks of it, but I feel that hearts do break. Why, well, she never complains about anything. She doesn't bend her private griefs on people innocent of causing them. No, oh, you do put things so nice, Miss Steiner. Shall I turn up the lamp a little, Miss? Oh, yes, thank you, Hannah. Perhaps Miss Jane's gone to meet Mr. St. John's coach on the way back from London. Why, here they are now. Give me a special kiss, Di. St. John has just discovered that when destiny led me to your hospitable door a year ago, it was to that of my own kindred. Oh, Jane, have the moors turned your brain, darling? No, she's quite sane. Now let's be quite calm and collected. Hannah, I wish to be alone with the ladies. Very good, Mr. St. John. I've just been telling Jane some strange news, Diana. You know, I went up to London to see Mr. Briggs, our family solicitor. About father's will, wasn't it? Exactly. On my arrival, Mr. Briggs informed me that our uncle, John Eyre, had died in Jamaica. And though he left us nothing, he did mention in his will a niece, hitherto unknown to us, one Jane Eyre. And Jane Eyre is Jane Elliot. Uh -huh. oh, but how did you connect it with Jane? Well, Mr. Briggs told me how he'd searched high and low for a certain Jane Eyre, whom he had saved from a false marriage with a Mr. Rochester a year ago. Yes. He made inquiries at Thornfield, Rochester's place at Milford. Yes, yes. And was told there she had left on the night of the interrupted marriage. But, Jane, I remembered I... the conditions of Jane's arrival here just a year ago and asked him to describe her. The rest was easy. Did Mr. Briggs tell you anything of Mr. Rochester? Nothing. Mr. Briggs had received a reply signed Alice Fairfax, saying that you had completely disappeared, though they had searched far and near for you. Who searched for me? Was it Mr. Rochester? I presume so. Rochester must have been a scoundrel. Don't judge until you know the inner springs of a man's actions. Where is Mr. Briggs? He may know something of Mr. Rochester. 
I sometimes feel all is not well with him when I'm out on the moors. I doubt if the solicitor could help you, or if he is interested. In the meantime, you forget essential points in pursuing trifles. Trifles? Well, don't you wonder why Mr. Briggs searched for you? Why? Merely to tell you that our mutual uncle has left you all his property. You are now rich. I? Rich? An heiress? Yes, an heiress. You will, of course, have to establish your identity, but that will be a simple matter. Ah, uh, I see you smile at last. Perhaps now you will ask how much you are worth. How much? Twenty thousand pounds. Twenty thousand pounds, Jane, dearest. Well, if you'd committed a murder, you couldn't look more aghast. Well, it's such a large sum. Are you sure there's been no mistake? No mistake. Why was I chosen? Why more than Diana or you? Because Uncle John was asked by your father before he died to take care of you. Instead, he handed you over to a Mrs. Reed, his sister-in-law, and discovered she sent you to a charity school. He only heard about this six months before he died, and he salved his conscience by making you secure from now on. God bless him for that. For now we can stay together always. We shall divide the inheritance equally. You are just as much entitled to it as I. But it was left to you. Never mind. It would benefit me to have 6,000. It would depress me to have 20. And Diana and I need never worry, even if our pupils grow up and leave us. But, darling, think what you could do with so much money. See the world, travel, meet fresh people. No. I crave more for family life. I've never had a home... Brothers and sisters. But we are that to you now. Besides, you may marry, and your aspirations after family life and domestic happiness be realized that way. I shall never marry. I want my kindred. But there are higher things than domestic affections. One must use one's talents. Listen to one's call from God. That's why I shall be leaving you next month. Are you really bent on India, St. John? My plans are unchangeable and more easy of accomplishment now that Jane insists on sharing her inheritance with you. I, of course, will accept none of it. Oh, but St. John, please. Well, you darling, it's like a fairy tale and you deserve to be the heroine. Mr. Anna. Oh, coming, Hannah. Jane. Jane, I go in four weeks. I've booked my berth in an East Indiaman. It sails on the 20th of May. You are going to do a great work, St. John, to convert the heathen. Have you no call to work for God, Jane? What does your heart say? My heart is mute. My heart is mute. Then I must speak for it. Jane, come with me to India as my helpmate. You are formed for labor, not for love. Not for love? Is that your opinion? I claim you not for my pleasure, but for my God's service. <sighs> so you would wrap me in an iron shroud. Not for love? Oh, St. John, what do you know of that gift to humanity? You ask me to be your wife, and you've no more a husband's heart for me than a rock for a plant. You prize me as a soldier would a good weapon. Your scholarly mind, your character, your youth would be invaluable in my work. Jane, you would not repent marrying me. Enough of love will follow on our marriage. Your idea of love. <laughs> Counterfeit sentiment. You see, I have known the reality. Oh, St. John, you are good with the terrible, devastating goodness of the unimaginative, which would soon kill me if I married you. Your words are violent, unfeminine, and untrue. They would seem inexcusable. Only it is the duty of man to forgive seventy times seven. I know to whom your heart is clinging. The love you cherish is lawless and unconsecrated. You are thinking of... Fairfax Rochester. Yes, I want to know where he is, how he is, before I dispose of my life. God did not give it to me to throw away. But you wish to do something useful for your fellow creatures with that life. Marry me and come with me into God's vineyard. You tell me with your usual frankness that I'm not formed for love. Don't you mean your love? 
then I not fawn for marriage with one who admits that. Besides, you are too much my superior. Only love enables us to endure superiority, St. John. And I don't love you. Your nature is too impassioned. Human affections and sympathies have too strong a hold on you. I don't love you, St. John. God will guide you, Jane. Your duty lies so plain before you. My master was long-suffering. So will I be. Remember, we are bad to work while there is yet day. I offer you your chance. Leave everything behind you. Come with me, I beg of you. Decide, Jane. Decide. If you were convinced it were God's will to marry you... Wait. Did you hear that? It's nothing but the wind over the moors. No. Oh, it sounded like my name. It's a voice, I tell you. Listen. It's a sign. God is telling me. That call to me is pain and woe. No, St. John. I will not marry you. Jane, where are you going? Jane! Rochester, I'm coming, my love. I'm coming. Control yourself, dear. Who can it be to cause you such excitement? Oh, Mum, it's her own little self, all dressed up in spring muslin like a picture out of a fairy tale. But tell me, who? Miss Eyre, Mum, the master's bride that wants to be. Oh, whatever will he say? Shall she come in? Shall she come in? Oh, Jane, Jane, my dearest girl. Oh, why didn't you come before? Elia, don't mention Miss Eyre's arrival to anyone yet. Can I rely on you? Oh, Bam, not for all the world. I understand. Take Miss Jane's bonnet and cloak here. I'll call you if we require anything. Oh, we searched high and low for you, dear. Your going like that nearly killed him. But I understood. You did right, my child. Poor Jane. My heart bled for you. First tell me, is he well? He's away, I suppose. He's here, out there walking in the orchard, where he is every morning. Yes, he is well, but he is in great trouble. Yes, I know. That's why I'm here. Then you've heard. But it happened months ago. Why didn't you come then? Tell me. We had a dreadful calamity. Calamity? Tell me. Wait, my dear. Be patient with an old woman. A fire broke out in the dead of night about six months after you had gone. Oh. The whole west wing and part of the servant's wing was destroyed. The fire just stopped at this wall. Was she hurt? She was killed. And Grace Poole was suffocated by the smoke. How did it happen? It seems that Grace sometimes drank too much. And the poor mad creature came to realize this and used to watch for the times when Grace would be in a drunken sleep and escape from her quarters. Well, one night she managed to get as far as your old room and set fire to your bed. For there must have been some strange knowledge of you in that poor crazed brain. Then she went, she went back and set fire to the hangings in Grace's room. The house was soon in an uproar. Then somebody called out that the poor demented woman was on the roof. And there she was, screaming and waving her arms about and laughing wildly, that long black hair streaming out against the flames. He went up through the skylight and onto the roof. I saw him approach her, and then she gave a scream and sprang forward. The next minute, she lay smashed on the pavement. And he? Was he unhurt? Oh, my dear. Prepare yourself. Please, please. The fire burnt his forehead and his eyes. 
He is blind. In trying to save her. It's like him. I'm grateful. Grateful he is alive. Wait till he hears your voice, my dear. Never was woman loved as he loves you. He searched for you as if you were the most precious jewel in the world. After you left, he grew savage. He wanted to send me away and to be left alone with his grief. But I wouldn't leave him. God will reward you. Oh, if I had only known. And, and where is Adele? Oh, she's at school in France. He lives here alone, shut off with his blindness, proud and suffering. Alone. He will be alone no longer, Mrs. Fairfax. <gasps> there he is. My poor darling. Look at him feeling his way with a stick, turning his sightless eyes up to the skies. Oh, Mrs. Fairfax. Be brave, my dear. Meet him with a laugh. You know, he used to love to hear you laugh. You go now, dear Mrs. Fairfax. I must meet him quite alone, in, in my own way. Of course, my dear. God bless you. Julia? Is there some coffee? It is Julia, isn't it? No. Who's there? Speak again. Did you want some coffee, sir? Who is it? Who speaks? Mrs. Fairfax knows who I am. I arrived this morning, but you have not welcomed me yet. Great God. What delusion has come to me? What sweet madness has seized me? <laughs> no delusion. No madness. Where, where are you? Or is it only a voice? Oh, God, for my eyes. Whatever, or whoever you are, let me touch you, or I cannot live. Her very fingers, her small, slight fingers. Is it Jane? Is this her shape and size? She is all here. And her heart, too, my love. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. Has come back to you. But I cannot be so blessed after such misery. I've had this dream so many nights and clasped you to my heart, only to find it empty mockery. Gentle dream nestling in my arms. You, too, will fly. Kiss me before you go, my dearest Jane. Now, do you believe? It is you, Jane. You have come back to me? Forever, this time. And you don't lie dead in some ditch under a hidden stream. No, Nor no. are you an outcast among strangers. Oh, no, my love. Why at least did you leave without money? Oh, Jane, you could have had half my fortune, even if you had insisted on leaving. But who found you? Who told you how dire was my need? The wind wailing on the moors. It cried out to me, Rochester. You cried out to me. Then there is a merciful God, Jane. Four days ago, at dusk, I stood in the orchard and raised my face to the sky... I called on God to have mercy on me, and if you were alive, to send you to me. I heard you, and I came. Did Mrs. Fairfax tell you? Everything. And you will stay with me? I will be your companion 
and your eyes. You will not be left desolate as long as I live. But the world will call me selfish. You are young. Someday you must marry. <laughs> I do not care about being married. If I were what I was, I'd make you care. But a sightless man? No. No, not for you, Jane. <laughs> it is time someone undertook to rehumanize you. You are slowly being changed into a lion. Am I hideous, Jane? Very. You always were, you know. <laughs> oh, Jane. I want you for my wife. Will you marry me? With pleasure. A blind man? You'll have to lead by the hand. With joy. Oh, my darling. God bless and reward you. He is rewarding me. To be your wife is for me to be as happy as I can be on this earth. Come, give me your hand. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte was dramatized by Helen Jerome and adapted for broadcasting by Philip Garston Jones. The cast was as follows. Jane Eyre, Caroline Maud, Mr. Rochester, Alan Brown, Mrs. Fairfax, Vera Lennox. Other parts were played by Daphne Odin Pierce, Lisa White, Peter Montier, Nigel Goodwin, Lionel Hamilton, Glyn Jones, Margaret Denyer, Robert Mill, Janice Edgard, Cynthia Bizarre, and Norman Wingrove. The production was by Hugh Stewart and Lionel Hamilton in the BBC's Midland Studios. <laughs> ¶¶